Those who don't know me, I'm Hugh Sanderson, responsible for the HXCPP backend. Uh, going to talk about what's new in the in the backend for this year. Um, got a bit of a theme going here with Breaking Bad, but I'm hoping that there's not too many bad breaking changes going on. Uh, originally, I thought there wasn't really that much to talk about, um, but I actually spent a lot of time under the hood in uh, in the backend, so. Uh, there, I'll just go into some of the, the gory details. So the highlights of um, the last year is uh, a big refactor in the way the OCaml code was written. The original code was you know, over five years old now, and when I first started, I didn't really know what I was on about that much, so I've learned a bit since then. Um, I've also upgraded some of the internal structures in the, the actual uh, header, header files that CPP uses. The enum interfaces and anonymous structures have all, all had a bit of an overhaul. And again, some of those date back five years or more, um, so it's probably a bit due. I've done some GC optimizations. Actually, these, are, these were already released in um, 3.2, 201 or something like that. Uh, so you may have already seen, seen these optimizations in your own code. They were mainly to do with some micro optimizations, which just involves real code code level tiny changes, uh, defragging, which is an optional thing you can use uh, to stop holes in the memory, which I'll, I'll talk about that a bit later, and just setting the default size of the available memory space was a pretty big win that only took you know one line of code. So, um, as I said, I'll talk about those in a little bit. I've also um, made a big change with the 3.3 compiler and uh, HXCPP is, is moving towards binary free. So uh, I won't be distributing or I won't be requiring the NDLL files that uh, normally sh ship with HXCPP. And to compensate for this, I've added a compiler cache uh, to uh, cu cut down the compile times. So if we have a look inside into the guts of the compiler. Um, as I said, a substantial rewrite of the OCaml code, and most of this was about being able to reason better about what the Hax compiler thinks the type is and what the CPP compiler thinks the type is, and knowing when to do a conversion and when I need a cast and, and when I don't. Um, also, the generated code output looks quite a bit different now. I'm not sure if any of you have ever delved into the generated code, um, but I'm, I'm hoping for an, a much better correspondence with your Hax code. So if you wanted to use a native debugger, it would be um, more viable or more interesting. And I've added this annotate source defined um, for CPP and the CPA debug if, you're, um, if you want to get into actually try to get inside the mind of the HXCPP backend that will add some comments to the code, which may or may not mean anything to you. So we start with this, um, the simple X code um, gets compiled into CPP now. You'll notice the line numbers are on the left, more like you would see in a standard IDE. Uh, there's not a lot of temporary variables hanging around, um, which I actually can't take credit for that because that's come from the uh, core compiler. Uh, you see the for loop change to while loop, but otherwise there's a pretty good correspondence between what I wrote in, um, in hacks and what we see now in, in CPP. Uh, the CPU code, if you compile with minus debug, you actually get an ASCII file, which looks a lot like the AST dump. And now I've just got these little hash comments of, you know, print lin and the class name and a few other things, uh, which just make it easier to follow if you want to um, get in there and, and see what's happening. So that's just um, if you want to tinker with some of the some of the output options. So into the structures. Um, I redesigned some of the structures to minimize the, uh, the number of allocations and the amount of memory required to represent some of the more common things. Um, I introduced the CPP variant type, which has just got a little type flag, which can be string or bool or object or something like that, uh, and, and the data. And so it's slightly larger than a normal object, um, but it means that a single, single struct here can represent any of the hex types 
And it's slightly slower to actually read from this structure because you have to check the, the type to see if it's a string, then you need to do something, otherwise you do something else. Um, but it's much faster to set because you don't actually need to box a type like you would with the dynamic. So you can set a, a variant to an integer, it's a very fast operation, um, and you don't need a memory allocation which adds up quite quickly. So I think there'll be um, a good bonus across the board for people using some of these more dynamic access methods. And this is used when you uh, query a type by name now, uh, sorry, member by name from, from an anonymous type. It's all using um, variant now instead of dynamic. So here is um, an enum and what it used to look like in 3.2. Here, uh, enum, val, it's got three fields, an int, string, an object. Um, before, the enum object used to have an array of arguments. The array would have a, uh, a set of byte data and each of those arguments would itself be a boxing of one of those values. So you can see the simple enum here would have maybe five, five or six allocations associated with it. Now in 3.3, .3, I build a single structure with a single allocation that has enough room at the end to stick the parameters in and I just stick the parameters one after the other in, in a variant format. So it's much more efficient uh, and compact type and doesn't require any additional allocations um, like it did, did before. Uh, similarly for our anonymous structure here, I have, uh, you declare anonymous structure with three fields, A is an int, B is a string, C is a some kind of object. Uh, in 3.2, this would be represented by the anon class, which has a hash object, so which inquires hash itself becomes an allocation. Uh, it has an array, which is a bunch of bins, so that's an allocation. Each one of those bins points to a, a linked list of elements, each of which is an allocation. And they themselves may require boxing if, um, if the array is not homogeneous, as it isn't in this case. So in 3.3 .3 now, uh, for an anonymous structure where you declare it in this kind of style here, it uses a single allocation using the variant types again, um, so it can list the three members. Here I've, I've put the, the mouth out of order alphabetically just to indicate the fact that it's using a hash rather than a, a, a string order to get at the anonymous fields. But um, it's still a valid anonymous object. Like you can delete these fields from it and they will go away. And I've got this hash at the end here, which is the same structure as in the 3.2 and that's kind of like an overflow field. So if you start pushing additional um, stuff onto this, you, you'll basically have a similar performance to how it was before. Um, I've also added this metadata fixed that you can add to an anonymous structure at declare time. So if you, um, when you actually write, write an expression like this, this hard hardwires the types into the anonymous structure and you can use up to five types um, with this, with this optimization. And in this case, they're not boxed, uh, they're not boxed, they're also not variants, they're, they're strongly typed sitting in the anonymous structure. Uh, with some kind of, and the, the string lookup there is reasonably well optimized as well. So the, you can use, like, you can't put this on universally across all the, your hacks code because if you, if someone gets one of these structures and expects to be able to add a member to it, they won't be able to, and you won't be able to change the type of one of the, the um, members and you also won't be able to delete it. So you can't use this everywhere, but I think you should know when your little anonymous structure is designed to be a kind of fixed thing and you're not really looking to add stuff to it, like maybe you want to return two values from a one function, um, you could use the, the fixed notation to deliver them. And this, again, uses a single allocation and it's kind of um, fairly, fairly optimal uh, for an anonymous object. Um, interfaces is something else that I've changed the implementation of a couple of times in CPP. In 3.2, they involve creating a little delegate object uh, and when you, um, so when you assign an instance to an interface type variable, uh, it creates a little delegate that has a, like a trampoline function. So when you call a function on, on the interface, it actually jumps off and calls that function on a different object, um, which allows me to do, you know, to have different objects implement the same interface. There's a problem with this is that it obviously requires the creation of the extra delegate. Um, and there's two function calls involved when you make an interface function call. It's got to call the little delegate object and then he trampolines it off to the, um, to the real object. In 3.3, .3, it still does require two 
function calls, but they're slightly different. Um, now, when I assign it, an interface is actually just typed as dynamic. So effectively, I erase all the type information when you assign it to an interface. And at call time, I query the, the, the function array from, from the instance. So here at this case, I'm querying the interface out of it, which gives me an array of function pointers, and then I call a function on one of those. So instead of having the two virtual functions I did in the 3.2 case, I've got one query function followed by a member function pointer, which actually adds up to be, it's probably slightly slower than the 3.2 case, but again, it avo avoids the allocation, and it also avo avoids issues with the interface function actually, sorry, the interface implementation object being exactly the same as the interface itself, so physically the same pointer, whereas before there would be different pointers, so if you tried to compare them, I have to do a thing where I have to check to see if it's a delegate or not, and then compare the, compare the pointers. So as far as your own code goes, um, you might not see much difference there, but it has simplified some of the, um, the code I've got, particularly uh, like arrays of interfaces, which is uh, something that was a little bit problematic before. And yeah, finally there's the um, array of dynamic, which has always been a bit of a pain as far as CPP goes. Hacks language doesn't really seem to mind too much whether uh, converting between an array of dynamic and an array of something else, but in CPP there's, the array of dynamic has quite a specific memory layout, and it's really just not compatible with an array of float. Um, and so you would run some code like this where uh, you'd assign an, ar an array of ints to the array of dynamic, which is fine. Um, I can then push a float onto this array of ints, which is also fine because it's an array of dynamic now. Um, then casting it into, <coughs> into an array of float, which is, which is kind of simulating something maybe like an adjacent passing scenario where yeah, the, the developer knows that it's an array of float because he stuck a bunch of floating point strings in to his JSON string, but um, now Hex has uh, made this, this typecast. Before in 3.2, at this stage, B would have to become a copy of A because they, have, they can't share the memory representation because they're quite different structures. Um, but now in 3.3, the array of dynamic actually is a little wrapper and has an implementation array sitting underneath it. So at the point where I cast it to an array of float, actually it changes the underlying implementation to an array of float, which can then share with B. So in this case, A is a dynamic that's pointing to an implementation of an array of float, and, and B is pointing to the same one, so that when I change B, A also changes. So that's just a, um, it's been a, on my bug list for about four years, so it's kind of good to get a solution for that. And I think it's actually a pretty good solution, um, because this actually allows the array of dynamic to stay as actually an array of integers, if, if that's really what it was. If you only ever push integers onto this array, the underlying implementation is an array of integers, which is probably what you want, and it's, it's more efficient than having an array of uh, box dynamics. Um, just a little point down the bottom here, uh, if what you wanted, instead of using an array of dynamic, if you're saying you're gonna have an array of anonymous objects, um, you can use this little, uh, little array emoji here, which is saying it's an array of object or something with fields, which explicitly excludes strings and integers and floats. Um, and by doing that, it means I can use a more efficient array structure because it doesn't have to be able to polymorph over to a to an to array of integers. And this is could well be what you mean. So if you actually mean an array of objects rather than an array of dynamic, um, you'll get a performance improvement on CPP by writing writing out like this. So. So the gory details, the garbage collection. <laughs> um, I, as I said, this, this code's already been out there for a little while now. Um, it was released in the C CPP Hackslib, independent of the Hacks compiler. Uh, the main change was I inlined the new operator into the header file for, for the most part. If it can make an allocation without really having to delve off into the internals and allocate a new block, it can just Make, a, make an allocation there in line in the header file. Um, and I also refactored some of the code that we need in, to do in order to keep track of the conservative marking to understand what actually is truly a GC object and what's not when I find it on the stack. So I, I refactored that to be 
I thought I had a quite a clever little way of doing it before that used no extra memory, but it turned out it was reasonably slow. So now it's not so clever, but it's much faster. Um, and um, that's probably where it's going to stay. And so that, that, that was quite a nice speed improvement. Um, on, the, on the high level, I've added this GC moving define, and that will allow for defragging, which means when you allocate a whole bunch of objects in a row, and you then um, say every fourth object is, is, is needed, and it, uh, all the ones in between aren't needed, you still have a problem where hacks can't allocate an object that's going to fit in the middle of those objects. So you end up with a whole bunch of free space between the objects that you've retained. Um, defragging moves all the used objects down to one end of memory and all the holes up to the other end of the memory uh, and therefore increases the amount of um, contiguous memory that you can allocate into. Um, only problem with the GC moving and why it's not on by default is that any back end that is not expecting its memory to move on it because it's got some kind of internal pointer to it uh, is not going to like having the memory moved on it. So it's kind of opt-in at the moment. Um, I think we'll maybe see how it goes over the next year and and maybe look to put it on by default maybe next year once we've um, seen, seen how some of the native code can, can interact, uh, basically probably explicitly pinning the memory and saying don't, don't, move, don't move this bit of memory on me while I'm using it. Uh, yeah, also tune the default memory size. That's really just a matter of going, start off with 20 megs of free space instead of two, and that means that you go 20 megs before you have to hit a GC allocation. Um, that, that's pretty good. You can control that yourself, so depending on your app, you might like to um, fiddle some of those parameters. That I think they're exposed in the hacks, but you can also change them on the, uh, with environment variables at runtime, I think. Um, and I've added this GC big blocks define, uh, which allows you to have more than one gigabyte of memory under control of uh, HACPP. Um, it just uses a slightly different structure. It could probably go on by default. I think it was a teeny weeny bit slower um, for a small project, um, but that's, that's not always an option now. I think you'll know if you need more because it'll, it'll crash on you and that's the time to start putting it on. So how does this all affect you? Um, I have a benchmark, which is the Mandelblot um, image generation benchmark, which is inside the Hacks compiler um, test directory. And contrary to what you might expect from its name, it's actually testing memory allocation speed rather than compute speed, because I've written it badly, deliberately or otherwise. Um, it creates a bunch of complex objects with just two fields, I and J, um, plus and a bunch of RGB objects. And it holds a large array of these, which actually is a bit of a problem for HXCPP because the collect time is proportional to the amount of retained data, and this is retaining quite a lot of data. Um, so it's quite a quite a, a good or well, hard test for the, the back end. So originally in 321, when I just used anonymous objects for the RGB and the INJ, uh, it was taking 113 seconds. Uh, to run on a 25 size, if you look, there's a 25 parameter in there. Um, and if you use strongly typed, it's seven or eight seconds, um, which is, you know, a little struct of complex with a float i, float j. Um, so having introduced the GC improvements at the end of last year, the anonymous types uh, kind of halved. So that's, that was quite, quite good for the GC backend. Um, now in 3.3, when I moved the anonymous structure to the variant structure, it's gone down to 18 seconds, so this is another threefold yeah, improvement over what it was in 3.2.1. Um, and if you add the fixed metadata, it goes down to a 11, which is like a 10x improvement on the uh, original uh, anonymous speed. And now 3.3 typed, it's down to 2.28 seconds, and that's uh, due to the GC optimization. So you can see how heavily dependent on GC uh, performance this benchmark is. Um, it's like a th 3x improvement from, from the improved GC. And if I turn on 64-bit compile, uh, it gets actually under two seconds. So this is on a Windows box. So it's been quite good. And so, you know, you might think, well, that's fantastic. What a, what a sensational target the CPP target is until yeah, JavaScript, and it comes out 1.1 seconds. <laughs> um, 
it's, I guess it's got an awesome GC allocator, is it really my conclusion? And it's effectively is, it has almost the same amount of information the CPP compiler has um, because it's relatively simple for it to deduce the fact that you've got two floats, you're doing multiplication operations, so it doesn't have to really guess whether it's an object or a float or whatever. Um, and so there's some, still some work I can do. JS has a slight advantage. It doesn't have to worry about any of the conservative marking stuff that I have in CPP and it's, it can be single threaded so it doesn't have to get a, a thread local context for the allocator. Uh, but it's still doing a pretty good job. Yeah, but not as good as Java, which is doing even better. Um, it'll give the Java guys and the Java backend guys some credit here. I think it's, uh, it's got an awesome GC allocator. A lot of smart guys have spent a lot of time on it. So uh, I don't think I'll ever get as good as Java on a memory, straight memory allocation benchmark partly because of those reasons I outlined, but also uh, just the sheer manpower and tweaking every last, you know, squeeze every last bit of performance out of it. Um, but still, these, I, call these, I would call these all compiled targets. The JS, I'm calling a compiled target because it's got its JIT and it actually is doing something quite similar. If I look at sepia uh, for the same benchmark, which is an interpreted thing, 46 seconds, and Nico, 95 seconds. So um, this is and in, in this graph that's not looking quite so dire, but it's um, yeah, there's still some work to do. So <laughs> the CPP uh, standard libraries, um, STD, regex, ZDB, SQL, SQL, uh, and now SSL, which has been a contribution that I haven't had to do anything for, which has been great. Um, so these are now no longer linked as pre-compiled libraries or, or NDLLs. So in 3.3, you simply do not need these, um, these binaries anymore. I uh, currently am shipping them just so that if you've got code that expects them to be there and you, you know, try to copy the DLL, it, it won't error out on you. Um, but so for a transition period, I'll, I will still ship these libraries and DLLs. Or if you're using the 3.2.1 compiler, you'll still need them. Um, but eventually, they might go away. I've changed the calling from a, the FFI call into a, just a direct normal C call. Um, seems much easier, sort of under the why didn't you do that before kind of kind of basket. Um, that's been a little transition there, but that's good. It, the compiler is smart enough to only pull in the files that it needs, so if you don't use regex, it doesn't need to bring in the regex files. Um, and, you know, the good thing here is that I no longer have to deal with different versions of the compilers. Like if I shipped a library, Visual Studio um, 2013, libraries don't work with 20, 2015, so I either got to ship both or choose one or well, there's sort of really no, no good answer there. Um, and so this ends up being a little bit more compile time because you actually have to compile these on your own machine if you use them. Um, but I have a solution for that as well and that is in the cache. Um, the CPP compile cache, uh, you, you can opt into it by setting the, this uh, configuration variable for HXCPP to use. Your HXCPP config XML is probably the best place to set it. You, you point it at a directory uh, and then the CPP compiler will, will use your cache. Um, currently, it's, the fault size is a gigabyte, but you can change that. I've, haven't got a good feeling for what size it should be yet. Um, maybe more. I'd also recommend sticking it on a solid state drive. Um, a little bit of area there for it, uh, just to you know, make sure everything runs nice and fast. And you can manage it with the, the Hackslib run HX CPP. There's cache. The cache has got a few commands, list and clear, and a few other things uh, just to see what's going on. And the good thing about this is it will share your OBJ files between projects. So project A uses one OBJ and Project B uses the same one, you only need to compile it once. And it works off the contents of the files, not just the dates. So if you copy a file from one place to another, it will still be able to find it in the cache. Um, and if you change it and change it back, it will still be able to find the old file in the cache. Uh, currently, you need to opt in to using the cache with your own files. Like if you've got a library um, with your own build.xml file, you actually have to explicitly set that you want to use the cache because you have to really get your dependencies correct. If 
you don't have your dependencies correct, if you change a header file, the, the CPP build system doesn't know you've changed anything and won't recompile it. So currently that's opt-in, um, but I, I put it, put this into quite a few projects, so it's pretty straightforward. Another thing I've got here is I can tag a compiler flag to be directed at an individual file. If you recall, I had the GC moving define earlier. There's only one file in the whole code base that needs to know, well, no, GC moving's different. Everything in Hacks needs to know that. Um, actually, well, there are, other, there are other flags that only the GC needs to know about. Um, and previously, if you added one of these flags to command line, it didn't know which files needed, which ones didn't, it just recompiled everything. And now it will just recompile a single file if you change um, change one of these these uh, compiler options that has been tagged at individual files or groups of files. I got a little a demo at the end. So uh, what else is new? Um, S std lib I've added. So these are these are in the CPP um, package in the standard compiler. You get direct access into malloc and free if you want to do your own little memory stuff. Uh, there's some native GC stuff in there where you can create your own object with room at the end, like I've done with the anonymous objects and the enum objects, and then you can stick your own data in there, and then you don't have to worry about um, managing the lifetime of that object because it'll be correspond to the lifetime of your of your larger object. Um, I've added CPP finalizable uh, as an easy way for doing a hacks finalizer. It's, it's more efficient because you can't undo it, whereas before I needed to keep track of which finalizers could be removed. Here, once you add it, it's on. Um, I, I don't keep track of how to remove it, so I can use more efficient structures underneath. Um, the CPP also generates non-virtual functions where possible, so if you have a class that has a function in it, if that <coughs> function is not overridden by any other class, uh, it doesn't need to be a virtual function, and this lets the compiler, uh, the real CPP compiler, um, make optimizations or inline it if it, if it can. Uh, it's just sort of helping out the uh, CPP compiler there. And uh, the HX Scout project has been um, has been contributed by Jeff Ward, which is great for tracking down GC leaks and other other issues um, with with those HX CPP allocations in general and profiling them. So you can get a reasonable improvement just by seeing what's hot in the in the, in the allocation path. Native Gen is something else I've tried to um, sort of import from the from the Java way. Uh, if you tag up an interface with Native Gen, it will use virtual inheritance in C++, uh, multi virtual multiple inheritance to, to implement the interface. And this means that the interface is not really a hacks object and you can't you know, query stuff on it dynamically. Um, but you can pass it to external code that can then use this interface. Um, and if you could construct a series of interfaces and classes with static functions that only use native gen classes themselves in their function and variable definitions, uh, you can create a bunch of external includes that you can give to someone else that are free from the hxcpp.h include. So um, it doesn't, doesn't, you're no longer bound to any implementation changes in the hxcpp. So this is just a way of being able to use uh, hacks to generate an external library with some um, reasonably decoupled uh, header files. So just going over what I said last year, that I'd remove dynamic where possible, and I think the fake and non-types and fix pretty much does that, and same with the enums. Uh, they no longer have the dynamic underneath them. I said I'd investigate some GC alternatives, and I have done that. Uh, there is quite a, some improvements there. Uh, obviously, there's some, some more we can do. Um, and CPU JIT didn't happen. And unless something changes, that it may or may not happen uh, in the future. So uh, I still want to have a look at some kind of generational or current garbage collection, um, mainly to get down the, the pause time of the garbage collector if you want to use it inside a game. You don't want it stolen out for. 10 or 15 milliseconds and dropping a frame. So if I can get that down to more like one or two, um, that would be nice. Uh, I like to refactor the CPU code in, inside of the OCaml compiler, which was something I didn't really get to because um, sort of ran out of time. Um, 
and that, that should tidy things up again. And yeah, the CP JIT, until I guess unless someone really wants it, it, it might not happen. Um, so I just have a quick look at some of the demo for the compiler cache. Um, So I'll make a quick little program here. Uh, yeah, maybe I can. I should have just copied this one. Mistakes, so gone out. So, uh, enemy. Um, so, running um, enemy on this uh, using this toolkit, which is using the native libraries that are now shared by. <laughs> It was very fast because it was all cached. Let me uh, uncache that for you. So, cache. So here it's compiling the um, enemy hex files um, as it goes. Now it's compiling um, the HXCPB runtime files, string, debug, thread, class, dynamic. Um, now it's compiling Zlib. Uh, now it's compiling the NME uh, actual CPP files that are part of the project. Um, compiling them straight in. Uh, now it's compiling the NME dependencies, which is um, free type, SDL, SDL mixer. Um, And mod plug, uh, Vorbis, JPEG, ping, Zlib, curl. <laughs> Funny, this is faster. All right, so there we go. And circle. So that's um, 60 seconds it's to compile basically everything from scratch. Um, now, if we go to a completely different project, So it doesn't squat. Yeah, I uh, can't spell. I'll change this instead of that. <laughs> so it compiles the boot, which refers to the name, application main, which again refers to the name. But uh, it's reused every other file in that, in that compile tree. So um, compile time. Uh, down to to four seconds. So that's, I guess, the the cache in action. It's put all the object files off in the cache directory, which is actually quite nice for, you know, source code cleanliness. Doesn't have to dump them all in your local area. So you can just blow them all away, 
and start again anytime you like. You know, if, if you run any of the more complex programs, um, um, it will share what it can and what it can't. It, there's still some issues like with dead code elimination that if one of the files has some functions not used in it, it gets smaller, you can't reuse that file. Um, but you know, we can build up all the different combinations of the one file because they're all, so it will keep them all in the cache. Um, so you might be able to use some of them, reuse, not reuse some of them between projects. Different ones will reuse different subsets. So here it's compiling kind of all the, the Flixel stuff. Uh, but it will reuse all the um, NME stuff. Um, oh, it's doing regex. Uh, we hadn't done regex before, so it's doing it there. It doesn't take too long to compile. Oh. Oh, ah, there we go. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's actually probably my, my uh, demonstration talk for today. So, if there's any questions, I'll take some questions. Thank you. The main question, uh, when will it be released? Uh, so the CPP code is already there. That's in the 3349. Um, you can actually use the compiler cache. 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 No. Uh, today. <laughs> today. Um, uh, but because, like, for instance, the files that brought in this regex library here is in the 3.3 hex distribution code. So it won't do much good until that's out. Yeah, the RC's out on the, on the website. So you can give it a give it a go today. And obviously we're heading for a, a release of 3.3. I don't want to preempt anything here. Let's just say soon. So you know, soon. Um, yeah, and that's uh, so that's the, the time frame, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, so I was wondering in the example you showed that uh, promoted the dynamic array to an int array or to a float array or something. Yes, like that yes. Thought. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what happens if then at the end of that code I write a push string foo. Uh, at the point of the cast, it's locked it in. So if you explicitly convert a dynamic array to something else, mm. this array becomes locked as a float. If you push a string, it'll convert the string to a float, zero, and push a zero on the end. So it becomes strongly typed at the point that you assign it to a strongly typed array. Okay, so the, the code will kind of compile and the underlying structure at runtime will remain and then just coerce the value uh, yeah, so as well as it can. Yeah, as, as best it, as best it can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you. Mm.